of just the sweetest couple uh, up there on the screen. Um, no, they, they are. Uh, yeah, so we, we want you to know about our Easter services. Please come for Good Friday. It's going to be a great service. One service, as we've said. And the reason we say these things over and over and over again is because, you know, it, it's hard to get information out to you guys and out to everyone. And then Easter Day, two services, uh, no uh, family ministry. So if you have kids, unless your child is in Wambalan, and if you're new here, that means your child is shorter than this. Okay, if they're shorter than this, they can go to Wambalan. But other than that, we're inviting, it's a family service. We're inviting everybody uh, to come in here for, uh, for Easter service. So, all right. I'm excited to talk about this today. Um, we're going to tackle something today as we finish up the cross uh, series that I've been doing for the last four weeks or three weeks. And then today, the idea has been, let's look at the cross because what do we celebrate at Easter time? We celebrate the resurrection. And the resurrection happened because Jesus died on the cross. So I thought, well, let's spend a few weeks talking about the cross from different perspectives. So first we looked at the cross for the skeptic, and then we looked at the power of the cross, and last week was the turning point of the cross. And then today we're looking at the call of the cross. Now I've got to be honest with you, straight up here from the beginning, the verse that we're going to look at and the call of the cross it is maybe not the most gentle verse. It's not something that uh, we teach about a lot. I mean, some churches teach on it. Uh, they kind of maybe hammer on it a little too bit or a little too much. But we don't teach about this thing a lot because it's kind of a hard verse. Uh, this is a verse that kind of asks a lot out of us. Um, but I believe that in this, even in the hard scripture, even in the hard verses, there's an enormous amount of life and freedom that comes from it. And so we can't ignore it because if we ignore it, then we're missing out on some of the best truth and the best treasure that the Bible has for us. So let's get our mindsets right and just get prepared to jump into this uh, scripture. So I'm going to start off by reading it for you. And it's in Luke chapter 9, it's verse 23. And it says, And he was saying to them all, so this is Jesus uh, speaking, If anyone wishes to follow me. So they had, they had just, just to give you a little context, I hadn't planned on it, but they, they had just fed the 5,000. So there'd been, Jesus had been doing miracles. People were following Jesus already. In fact, he had tried to get away from people and they followed him across the sea in order to spend more time with him and get with him. And then they had to do the whole feeding of the 5,000. But that happened because Jesus had a following. Now, the majority of people that were following Jesus were following him for miracles or for, or for food. They wanted food. They wanted to be fed. And so that kind of gives us context here. When Jesus says, say to them all, if anyone wishes to follow me, because they've physically been following me. So now we need to deal with the other side of it. So if you've been, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, that's someone that wants to be like Christ. He must deny himself. So set aside selfish interest. Some of us can't do that when it comes to planning dinner on a Tuesday night. All right. You know. Uh, and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And then it goes on and he says, and follow me, believing in me, confirming, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering. Oh, man, we should, okay, we'll ignore the rest of this here. You know, we just won't, we won't read or teach that part. But when he talks about following Jesus, when he says, follow me, it even means if need be suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard verse. So today we're all going to learn how to die for Jesus. No, we're not. We're going to learn how to live in Jesus. But, but this is a hard verse. They're going to put the, the entirety of the verse on the screens for you guys so that you, can, uh, so that you can see here. So in this verse, it comes from, here we go here. So in, in this verse, we've got some hard words. All right, some difficult words. And we, we, we can admit to that, even though we're in church, let's admit to it. You know, if you wish to follow him, we've got denied, take up my cross daily, and to be able to follow Jesus. Now, for most people, this maybe does not sound very attractive and very appealing. Now, I thought about this for a long time. I thought hard uh, about this. And I thought, how, why, what could I say that could make you out here say, Yes, I want that for my life. 
Because it, it, it's easy for me to just teach the scripture and say, well, here's what the scripture says, and therefore here's what you need to do with your life, and there you go. I hope that you're able to do that. But I just always want to put myself in your shoes and give you a little bit more because I know that I'm competing against a lot of things in your world right now. And just because I'm, I, this is my position to stand here and say this stuff, I don't expect you to just take it and do everything that I say. And so I, I think about it. I'm like, well, okay, why? Why does that matter? Why does it matter to you guys? And, and this one for me was a, was a hard one. It took a few days. I could say why it matters to Christ. And I can say why it theologically mattered. I, I know why it matters to me. But what about to everyone of you out there? Because it, th this is a hard thing, especially this part about following Jesus. It asks a lot from you. And it asks probably more for you. Or actually, I know that it does. This verse asks more from you than any other verse in the Bible. But if you'll hang with me, this verse also promises more for you than any other verse in the Bible. But we've got, we've got to get there. We've got to be able to see that. Now, these words here, there's three parts to this. And I, I wanted to start us out by looking at three reasons to not follow Jesus. So you didn't think you'd hear that in church on a Sunday. But here's three reasons for you to stop following Jesus. So the first thing that Jesus says is deny yourself. That means that that you are going to, uh, you're supposed to give yourself up. You're supposed to give over control and that sort of thing. But my counter to that would be, instead of denying yourself, well, you should never deprive yourself, right? So then instead of deny yourself, never deprive yourself. Matthew, put that slide. Thank you. So th th this is instead, I think this sounds better than this. I could deny myself or I could never deprive myself. I, I would like to share a testimony here. I have denied myself sugar and sweets and ice cream for like over a month, you know? I know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and you know what? Life is not as good as it was when I was never depriving myself. I'll be honest with you about that. Uh, life was a whole lot better. I open the refrigerator and uh, I look in it and um, people think I'm trying to cool down or I'm looking for something to eat. I'm crying. I'm silently <laughs> crying to myself. So you could deny yourself or you could just never deprive yourself. So, okay, let's look at the next reason why you should not follow Jesus. Jesus says that we should take up our cross. Now, there's a lot of things to this. Um, like for one, a cross is heavy. I don't know if I want to carry a heavy thing. Um, you know, it's probably got splinters on it. Uh, but when Jesus tells the disciples or he tells the people listening to take up their cross, they, they knew, see, we don't hear that through their context. They hear it through the context of like the Roman context of like, take up my cross. That means I, you want me to walk, you want me to join in this crucifixion thing. You know, no, no, thank you. You know, all these people have been following Jesus for food and for healing and for miracles. Now, Jesus starts talking about this, uh, deny yourself. No, 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 no. I'm here to not deprive myself because you fed 5,000 people. So now I want also to be fed. And you want me to take up my cross? Well, I, I want to counter that and say, no, what I suggest is that we never make a commitment that puts you out of your comfort zone. That's better for me. That sounds better. Because to take up your cross, you're like, you know, it's definitely out of your comfort zone. The idea of walking, following Christ to the crucifixion. But to deny yourself, take up your cross, it's, th this sounds better. I, I'm not going to make a commitment that puts me out of my comfort zone. So to follow Christ would definitely put me out of my comfort zone. And that brings me to the third reason here, to not to follow Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. He says, if you want to follow me. But my counter to that is also follow me. Because Jesus may say, follow me. But then what we say is, I will only follow me. Matthew, thank you for that. I will only follow me. So I'm not going to follow you or follow another person. I, I myself am only going to follow me. So what I've done is I've given you three great reasons to not uh, follow Jesus. Three great reasons to not accept what he's done for you on the cross. And honestly, I, I totally understand these things. And this is what the world would tell you. The world would tell you, don't deny yourself, don't deprive yourself. 
That's, the world would tell you that, no, you know what, don't make commitments to things that will put you out of your comfort zone. Don't stretch yourself. Don't overcommit to something. Don't, you know, you, it's okay for you to just be who you are. You don't have to say that you're a Christ follower and then make a commitment to be a Christ follower. In fact, don't claim that you're anything because then you can be neutral and fluid just across, across everything. And the world is, is, is also telling, hey, follow your heart, follow yourself, whatever that is. And you know what? You get to decide what I have to respect on your journey that you're following your own journey. So not only do you get to create your own journey, but then everyone around you has to honor that and respect that and go on that journey with you. This is what the world is telling us. This is what our society and our culture is telling us. And how do you think that's working for the world? How do we think that that's working for, for people? Well, I can tell you it's not working well. Let me show you some stats. Right now, uh, across the world, 280 million people in the world are dealing with depression. And in South Africa, 25%, that's the average rate of those in South Africa dealing with depression. Now, that averages through province as low as 14% and as high as 38% in some provinces of people that are actively dealing, reporting their issues and their struggles with depression. Uh, another one, opioid usage in the world right now. So opioid use increasing another 40% by the year 2030. This is something that, uh, that they are predicting that this is going to be. How, how about this one? How about in 2023, we saw 15,000 plus women involved in domestic violence with more than 960 murdered. Man, this, sound, this world's sounding great, right? You know, living for myself, committed to myself. I'm only going to follow me. I'm going to, I get to indulge. I don't, I don't have to deny. Instead, I, I get to have, have, have. You know, South Africa is experiencing, a, a last one here for you, 10% year over year rise in divorce rates since 2020. 10% year over year. You know, so, so the, the way that I read this is I look at what the world tells us that we should do. And when I say things like what the world tells us, I also mean me and I mean you. Okay, so the idea of, of I, need to, I need to deny myself. There are plenty of times during the day where I know that I need to deny what Chris wants and something in my flesh fights against that and I say like, ah, I don't wanna do that. And that, that is that sin nature. That's also kind of the influence from the world, from our friends, or from the pressures of, of life, society, culture, whatever it is that you want to call it. But the world is pulling us in this direction that is very different from what Jesus tried to model for us on the cross. And it's, it's not working all that great. It's not working all that well. You know, just looking at these numbers, and I, I didn't even include, I got depressed when I was researching this. There's the murder rate. There's, the, uh, there's the, the death rate, which is separate. I mean, there's just all these things. You know, I started researching. I thought, are our doors locked? Are the lights on outside? Like, are we safe here? Do we need to, you know, get everybody in the basement? You know, no one can drive to church tomorrow because the world is actually, it's like a, it, it's a beautiful, wonderful place, but there's, there's just a lot going on out there. And so if we live like the world, if we choose to live like the world, then this is what we have to look forward to. So the question for you then, not for the world, but then for you is, how is this working for you? How's this thing working out for you? You know, if you never deprive yourself, if you make no commitments, and if I only follow me, then how's that working so far? Are, are you one of the statistics? Are you a part of a statistic? I mean, I would hate to know that anyone in here is, and if you are, you know, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. But if you are, there's, there's also a way out of this here. See, a very difficult verse that we're starting to try and unpack, like what I wanted to show you right off the bat is that it's actually really good for you and it's actually really good for us. And I can show you that because I can show you what happens when the world ignores it. Because when the world ignores it, there's a massive amount of even just data that's behind it to show that this is not working for you or for me or for the rest of the world. And so, if you, I've got a, a quote for you here. If you do, and I want you to remember this, if you do what the world says to do, then you will suffer consequences at the hand of the world. Following a broken world's standards 
will only leave you broken. You know, so if, if you look at your life, do you ever wonder, why am I not satisfied? Why am I not happy? Why am I not content? Uh, why am I not okay? Why am I not loved? Why am I not loving somebody? It's probably because you're following this broken world's standards. But if you, if you do that, it's only, it is only going to leave you broken. And so I ask yourself this question, do you ever wonder? Do you ever wonder why you're not satisfied, happy, content, loved, loving, etc.? If you're looking for those things in your life, rather than looking for ways to fill those holes or fill those gaps or plug that area, maybe instead you should take kind of a step back and analyze and think, okay, whose standards am I living by? What what is it that I'm allowing to control my life and my decisions? Because we are so driven. We as, as people, we are driven by desperation. And that desperation that we're driven by is is we want to be happy. We want to be safe. We want to be secure. We want security in our lives. We want to be loved. We want to be cared for. But we, we we are driven by desperation. That's why we make bad decisions. That's why we jump into things before we're ready to jump into those things. Because we are, we are desperate for those things. But I want to tell you this morning, and this will not change. This is just a truth of life. This is not happiness. It's prison. And it, it, it's not even the pursuit of happiness. We think we're trying to pursue happiness. But in, instead, we're just stuck in this prison. We go round and round and round and round. And we keep wondering why we're not lifting up out of the struggles or out of the depression or the anxiety or, or why we can't find the happiness, the meaning, the belonging in our life. Well, if you follow the advice of the world then you're going to deal with worldly consequences. So what I have for you today, kind of this is what I want to offer you today, is like what, what if it was, what if there was a way for you to have a fulfilling life? And what if I were to be able to, to give you a promise for a truly fulfilling life? And, and, and just imagine with me for a second, imagine what this life could look like. Imagine how, 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 how fulfilling and how wonderful life could, could be. So in this fulfilling life that I could promise you, that is going to come with a peace that does not depend on your situation. Man, I am so glad that my peace does not depend on my situations. Now, whether or not I choose to apply that, totally different. But the fact that I can lean on is that my peace does not depend on my situation, and neither does yours. Your peace does not have to depend on your situation because there is a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's what comes from God. Man, give me some of that. You know, give me some of that. How do I get some of that? You know, that's what Jesus did on the cross for us. You know, another one, what if love and value, uh, what if you were to receive love and value whether you receive it from someone or not? You know, we're so desperate to be loved and valued by other people, but what if we just intrinsically had that? You know, I, I'll tell you this, if you're, uh, when, when I met my wife, when I met Casey, uh, we met in South Africa. She was a missionary, I was a missionary. We met, one of the most attractive things about Casey to me, amongst many, is that she loved who she was and she was happy with who she was without me. She did not need me to complete her at all. It was her and it was God and it, it did not require that I completed her because she knew her love and her value. You know, the idea of dating somebody now, oh, whew, man, you guys that are dating, oh, you know, like I just want to throw up, you know, to think about that. It is difficult. It is crazy difficult. And you're just, you, now you've got all the social media, you know, did they like me? They left me on red. They didn't leave me on red, you know, like... Uh, like my, po- you know, God, it's just so complicated. But you know what? I could simplify the most important relationship in your, in your life for you, and it's this one right here with Jesus. 
And that means that there is no leave on red. There is no answer or not answer. There is no call or not call. There is no wondering if something's, uh, if there's, you know, if, if Jesus is talking to somebody else. The cool thing about Jesus is he's omnipotent and omnipresent and he's everywhere and his line is always open. He'll always answer your WhatsApps and your FaceTimes. Jesus loves you and he values you whether you receive it from anybody else or not. And then this, this sense of purpose. I think when we lack purpose, when we're missing purpose, it leads us down into a dark place. And that that, that place often is where we find other things that we should not be doing. God, I'm just describing a life for us that comes with Christ, a really good life. And this is a promised life, a fulfilling life. And then lastly, I could promise you this, this faith, faith to trust, faith to believe, faith to not require understanding, and faith like a child. And you know, the more I see my, my little kids believe in stuff that doesn't make any sense, the more I see what, what Jesus means when he talks about having faith like a child. You know, you can tell, we can tell our kids anything and they believe it. It's amazing. You guys ever lie to your kids? Yeah. If you say no, then you're lying in here. All right. Because I, I know that you do. We lie to our kids all the time. Or, or I do at least. But... But this faith like a child, it's so innocent, it's so wonderful. You know, we get to have that with God. So this is a promised life that I have for you. And this promised life, uh, this joy-filled, love-filled, peace-filled, purpose-filled, faith-filled life that I have for you, I don't think anyone in here would look at this list and say, I don't want that. I don't, no, 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 no thanks. Personally, I love being trashed on and I don't want to be, I don't want my love and value to be, uh, you know, separate from my, my partner or my spouse or whoever. You know what? I'm, I'm super fine with my anxiety that keeps me up at three o'clock in the morning. I don't need peace in this situation. You know, if I, if, if I, if I have peace and I don't have anxiety, then, you know, I'm going to have to give up all the drinking and all the coping mechanisms that I've grown to love and feel comfortable with. You know what? I think this is peace is a whole lot better for us. You know, a sense of purpose. Like th- th- this, is, this, is, this is for you guys. When I think, why does this matter to you? Why should you accept this? One of the hardest, most costly verses that's in the Bible, Luke 9, 23. We're going to put it back on the screen for you here. One of the hardest, most costly verses in the Bible. This is how you accept and how you achieve that life that Jesus is promising us. That, that Jesus came to give you life. He died so that we may have life. Everything that Jesus did was for your benefit and for our benefit. And again, revisiting this story, Jesus has all these people around him. He's got his disciples around him. And he sees that they're following him, but not for the right reason. Not a wrong reason, but not the right reason. And if they continue to follow him in that way, then they're going to miss out on this promised wonderful life that he has from them. But he needs them to know that it comes at a cost. That which will cost you the most will have the greatest reward and impact and value on your life. If you don't wanna pay the price for it, then you're never gonna have it. You have to pay the price for it. See, Jesus has done the work to secure your salvation through grace. You don't have to pay that price. You know, would, would you rather you be the one on the cross and die for your own sins? You know, no, thank you. Jesus took care of that. All we have to do is follow him. So when you see this, I'm going to read it again. Read this. Hear this through the heart of Christ. This heart that says, I don't want you to follow the patterns of your world because it brings you nothing but pain and sorrow and hurt. All it does is it feeds the statistics that we live in. It, it, you know, they did a study in South Africa. This was five, six years ago, and I don't know how correct this is now. So to be as accurate as I can, there was a, a psychologist, a friend of mine, and he was a part of a study in South Africa five, six years ago. And he said that at the time, so at that time, maybe it's better now, I don't know. But at that time, the average stress that a South African was carrying. And that was through everything from uh, staying on, uh, waiting on the phone to talk to DSTV because your satellite doesn't work, to standing in line at clicks, to getting petrol, to then even the big stuff like safety and your home and all that stuff. And they compared 
the stresses of the average person on South Africa to a country that is war-torn and in an active war. You know, and, and when you look at all of the, those, those things, it all comes from just brokenness. That's where all that comes from. It's just brokenness. And so here we have a guy that says, well, I'll take care of your brokenness. It's going to cost you, but it's worth it. And so Jesus says, he says, hey, guys, ladies, if anyone wishes to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, then all you have to do is deny yourself. So set aside your selfish interests. You know, just daily take up your cross, which means to me that you would express a willingness to just endure whatever may come because I'm enough for you. And follow me. Believe in me. Conform to my example in living. And if need be, because suffering will come, perhaps even dying of faith in me. See, Jesus says this with such a tender heart for us. And so now I gave you three reasons to not follow Jesus. But now I'm going to give you the three reasons to follow Jesus. So Jesus says, he says, deny yourself. And what this, what Jesus is asking you to do here is he's asking you to give up control. He, he wants you to give up control and he also wants you to give up the perception of control. He, you know, a, a lot of, do we know any control freak? If you're married to a control freak, raise their hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. G Jesus wants us to lose control. He wants us to give up control. That, that's, why, that's how we have to deny ourselves. So we are denying our own self-interest. So I'm saying that I'm not going to live my life as a Chris-focused person. I'm going to live my life as an outward-focused person, as an others-first person. I'm going to put my agenda to the side, and I'm going to live my life and let something else be a greater influence in me than I am an influence in me. And I'll tell you, I, I love living this way. I love it. You know, I, I, I love, I grew up in a house where... I don't know if you this way, like my dad always drove. So my, my mom also drove, but if they rode together in a car, then dad would always drive. And that was like a man thing to do. It's like a, you know, a man thing. And, uh, and now that I'm married to Casey, you know, I drive often. Casey can't see sometimes. And uh, so I drive a lot when we're together. But I love when Casey drives and I just get to sit back and like do work or not do anything. Or like if we're going to a place where I know the parking's complicated or anything like that. I, I love when Casey just drives. And I, I tell myself, all I have to do is get in the vehicle and then get out when we arrive at our destination. Now for me, I can give up that control. But for me, it feels good. Maybe that's my anxiety talking. I don't know. Maybe you can relate. I don't know. I, I guess it would also be like taking an Uber downtown rather than looking for parking. But... It should feel good to give up some control. It, it may be really hard, but there should be some good that comes from it. I'm so glad that I'm not in control of my life. Do you know how quickly I would stuff up my life if I was in control of it? Like just instantly, it would take me milliseconds. But because I'm not in control, then I, okay, so who is in control if I'm not in control? Well, for, for me, it's God. My role in this, as I deny myself, is I just try and bump my life in front of Jesus enough throughout the day and in the mornings to start my day with it. But I just keep saying, okay, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. And that's all I have to do. And I, I can promise you, it takes all the pressure off of your world, all the pressure off of you. It takes all, it takes all that away from you. So if you're looking for a life of less pressure, if you're looking for, for an easier life, then maybe you should give up some control. Because Jesus is saying, deny yourself and let me, Jesus, be in control. Then he says, take up your cross. All right, so this is the next step to it. And what he's asking us to do with this here is he's asking you to make a commitment because Jesus made a commitment. Jesus made the commitment to die on the cross for your sins. Now, we don't have to hang on the cross and die for our sins because Jesus did that for us. But if you think just physically about taking up the cross, Jesus put the cross on his shoulders and he's walking down the road with that. The crucifixion was a one-way ticket. There was no, I'm gonna go there and y'all see in a minute, guys. Like there was no coming back. And so Jesus is saying to us, hey, Chris, 
take up your cross. Okay, Jesus, put it on. All right, there's no, it's a one-way ticket, me and Jesus together, because I'm not going back. I'm not turning back. It's, it's, it's me and Jesus. I, I'm telling Jesus, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to follow you, period, and that's it. I've denied myself, and because I've denied myself and I've given Christ control, I now can freely and even happily put that cross on my shoulder and walk that journey towards crucifixion. Because you know what? i tell you what. I'm so glad that my sin died on the cross for Jesus. That's what this is. Jesus is saying, take up your cross. Make the same commitment that I did. Make the commitment to follow through, to let your sin die on the cross. And then he says, follow me. And just like, uh, you know, before Jesus is saying, to follow me is to be a disciple. It's to want to be like Jesus. And so what he's asking us here to do is to recognize the value in following Jesus. You know, I can show you what happens when you don't follow Jesus. That's where all those stats and that kind of wonderful world picture that I painted for you is. This, to, to me, th- this is a lot better. You know, recognizing the value of following Jesus. I love being with, with people that are following Jesus because they're just kind and they're nice and, and they take really good care of me and they take really good care of others. This church is full of people that follow Jesus. And it's why it is as good and as great and wonderful as it is right now. So Jesus, he's given us these three uh, reasons to follow him, these three reasons to take up our cross, these three reasons to follow Jesus. You get the opportunity to deny yourself. You get the opportunity to take up your cross, march your sin to the cross. You can even imagine putting the beam on your back And taking that sin that you've really struggled with. I don't know if you've ever carried a big piece of wood. We grew up in the woods and we would put a big piece on our shoulder as little kids and take it over to uh, to be burnt in the fire and you kind of just chuck it down on the ground. Well, imagine that's your sin. Jesus says, take up your cross. You put it on every day and you walk to the foot of the cross and you just chuck it on the feet of Jesus. Let him deal with that. And then follow him. And yes, hard things may come. And times of persecution may come. We have been persecuted for it. We've had to pay the price for following Jesus, but it is absolutely worth it. Now, before we close, I, I want to read one more verse for you because there's a verse in Luke, the next verse, in verse 24 and then 25. And this explains why Jesus wants us to do this. Why would Jesus say, follow me by Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Well, he's asking us to do that because he loves us and he cares for us. Why would Jesus say, potentially put your faith in me, even though that means you're going to be persecuted, or even though that means you're going to have hardships or trials? Because Jesus is worried about the one thing and the one thing only that goes beyond this life, and that is your soul. Jesus is worried about your soul. He's not worried about... a a lot of other things in your life, the thing that he cares the most about is your soul and your eternity. And so he he gives this in verse 24. This is how he kind of qualifies verse 23. So he says, for whoever wishes to save his life. Now again, this is why. He's just told people how to follow him. And then now he says, okay, so if you wish to save your life in this world, Whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake, he is the one who will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. Let me explain this to you right here. What Jesus is saying here is if you want to hold on to not give up control, to not take up your cross, to not follow him, if you want to hold on to your money, to your finances, if you want to hold on to your comfort zones, to your habits, to your, uh, the things that you've built around yourself, if you want to hold on to your own self-sufficiency, I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman and I don't need to put my faith in anything else. I don't need to let open my hands or loosen my grip or let go. I'm fine just the way that I am. I've made myself. God, you're cool. And this whole Sunday morning thing is cool as long as there's coffee. And like, but that's, that's it. And if that's what you're saying, if you're saying that, that this life that I have here in this world, this focal point, this is the thing that matters the most to me then Jesus is saying that 
when you die, you are not going to gain the life of eternity with him in heaven. See, he is weighing out for you. This short life that we live now versus eternity forever. And he cares about your eternity. And so he says, then he says in the next part of this that whoever loses his life, go, go back one for me, Matthew. Whoever loses his life in this world will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. You know what it looks like to lose your life? It's just surrender. It's just you saying, um, okay, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I give you my life. Come into my heart. Save me. And I'm going to do the best that I can every day to follow you. Sometimes I'm going to get it right. Sometimes I'm going to get it wrong. But I'm just going to surrender to this life. And when you do that, you get to accept the grace, the forgiveness of the cross. But you also get that stuff that we talked about, the peace, the purpose, the love and the value, no matter what anyone says or does. You, you, you get the faith. You get all those wonderful things just through surrender. And then Paul goes, or Luke goes on in verse 25 here, and he says, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Wealth, fame, success. And then he loses or forfeits himself. See, nothing material can compensate for the loss of eternal life. Nothing. And, and, and this is what I'm, th this is why this matters to, to me and to you guys this morning as we wrap up and as we close and get ready for worship, is that not, no material thing can compensate for eternity. This really, it's about a perspective shift. You know, if I, if I put a briefcase of 10 million rand on the stage and, and I started listing out things that people, you know, could do to get that money, there's a lot of things that a lot of people would do to walk away with that money. So now just imagine Christ on stage, not, not Chris, but Jesus up there saying, all right, I'll, I'll cancel all your debt. I'll cancel all your sin. I'll forgive you. I'll handle your hurt. I'll handle your pain. I just need you to follow me. You know, let this life that you're trying to control and have, let that life go. And instead, accept the life that Jesus has for you. Because nothing material can compensate for the loss of eternal life. You know, one of my biggest fears, and th this is very much a personal fear, so I'll let you guys know. This, here's a struggle point for me, okay? This is, we're just talking, just you and, you and me, us and us. One of my biggest struggle points is that I will do something to get in the way or cause a distraction so that you guys out there will not have the opportunity to set your eternal life on Christ. I'm, t I'm terrified of it. But that's where I get to before I come on here in the morning. See, some people, they get nervous about coming out here. I don't get nervous because you guys are so kind and so wonderful. But some people, they get nervous. They get throw up sick. They deal with anxiety and all that stuff. I, I, I love it. I love talking with you guys. But the thing I have to repent of and the thing I have to do before I come out on stage is I have to say, God, praise the Lord that I don't have to be that great at this job for you to still work in this room. So I give up control. I deny, I deny myself. And then, and then I make the commitment, Jesus, I'm just going to tell the story of your love. I'm going to tell the story of the love of the cross. I'm going to make that commitment. And, and then, God, I'm just, I'm going to follow you. I can only do what I can do. And then, Holy Spirit, you have to do the rest. And, and that's my deepest, most authentic and sincere prayer for you guys. And so today, I put before you, I put before you and offer you the best version of life that you could ever imagine. It's to deny yourself, it's to take up your cross, and it's to follow him. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then the band's going to lead us in worship. My wife